Okay. Uh, welcome um, to the first day of payroll. I'm Andrea Beam. And this morning, we'll be going over the first day. And kind of what we'll be following here is if you go to your wiki and go to the SSD meeting and trainings, <clears throat> And you will see um, our ITC tr overview training. <clears throat> so for payroll, we're going to have the three days again, um, and about an hour and a half. May not use the whole hour and a half, um, but we did uh, about that amount of time. And you can see the agenda is be what we're going to be following today. Um, day one, we're just going to kind of go over the pre-beginning of the payroll process, um, any uh, new employees or payroll item changes, um, pay account changes, things like that, and then um, go into um, anything with um, adding attendance, absence, um, and that sort. So that's kind of what we'll be going through today. And then tomorrow and uh, day three, uh, Lori will be going through the remainder of starting a payroll and then what the um, post payroll reports to go over. Okay. And the other thing is um, we do have the recordings here and this is from last year. Um, we do have them broke down to different areas in the our recordings. So now you can just click on these recordings and you can see you don't have to go through the whole thing and kind of search through where you want to find in the whole three day um, recording that we have. Um, so this is kind of the same process. What we're going to do this year again is going through um, the payroll process. Um, there is a few new things that will be added that, you know, since last year has changed or, or updated, um, but pretty much this is the same. So if you have to leave and you don't get the finish, you can actually go back and just kind of click on that and it'll show um, an actual video of just how we are adding payroll items or the pre-balancing. Um, so that is a little time saver for you. So we'll be doing that again um, for this year. Okay. So what we're gonna start with first, um, is the appendix for the payroll process and what we're going to be going over um, with this morning. So the first thing you can find this in our USB documentation under appendix in the USB, um, USB payroll processing checklist. So again, um, this checklist is uh, just a sample. And again, districts um, can go ahead and update and add to this. Um, uh, remove things um, to what they specific, how they run their payroll. Um, again, we know that districts, all districts run their payrolls differently. So they can um, customize it to exactly how they want um, this list to show. This is just an example of the main points that um, districts should be doing. Um, if they want to add to to it, um, for things that they may forget that we don't have on here, um, please, um, please do. So the first thing we're going to go over is the pre-setups. So again, on our number one check, number one here in our checklist is the account um, sync. And again, they can find that under USAS and then the account sync. Again, um, they can do this every time before they run payroll if they like, if things are changing a lot between USAS and at payroll accounts and, and adding. Um, again, this runs every night. So um, if nothing has changed, if they come in the morning and nothing has changed, they don't need to run this. But if they feel comfortable running this every morning, there is no problem with doing that. Um, and they can go ahead and sync those accounts as many as times as they like. Um, the big thing is, is to make sure that they're waiting for this to say account completed. Um, we've had many tickets come in, like if they say they um, there's no account, they can't find it coming over from USAS. Um, and sometimes what the problem is, is they don't wait till that is completely 
um, says completed. So once that says that's completed, then they know their accounts are synced um, between USAS and payroll. So that is an, um, the first step that they wanna make sure. Okay. So our next step would be the verify the posting period. And again, they will find this under core and posting period. Um, we're a little bit um, behind on my um, my test um, district here. So I'm back in July, but again, your current will always show green. So I would have them always check to make sure um, if they're in um, what posting month they're in and making sure that their posting period um, line is green. So if they change the current, it's gonna change that line green to the next one. So right now I'm processing in July, little old, yes. Um, so again, they can use their grid and it shows um, the date that they opened it. This will never change and the date they closed. Now they can reopen um, the months and then reclose them. So this date can change if they're reopening and closing them. Um, again, they have the fiscal year and the last fiscal year um, column here, which can be helpful. And again, they can add to their column if they wanna show more. So again, they can get this set up how to their liking. Um, again, we have the boxes, which we have is open, a month can be closed, and then make current. So again, as a reminder, um, you can only have one month current. So that would be like if you're processing payroll, you have to have that month current in order to start um, your processing of payroll because you want to make sure it gets posted to the correct month. Now you can have multiple open months. So if they're still working in June, getting things balanced, reconciled, they can go ahead and keep that open Why they have July current. Um, but again, they wanna make sure that you really um, let your districts know that they need to make sure that they close those months in a timely manner. They don't wanna be months out because there are certain reports that do run on um, certain things in like compensations, um, if they're archived, um, especially, um, I believe it's the, my mind's going to draw a blank now, um, the employer distribution reports, I believe, um, that run um, every fiscal year. Um, those are very important. Not the employee distribution, excuse me. I'm thinking of the wrong reports. Obligation reports. Sorry about that. Um so again, they wanna make sure that they have those. Now, again, those, when you're closing um, those periods, there are certain reports that get um, sent automatically when you close, like monthly, if you close the period for um, quarter, the, that, that um, January, February, March. So if you close March, those reports will go out to the quarterly file archive. So you just wanna, and you can always go back and look for these reports and they're out there under utilities and file archive. And you can see which reports when they close a posting period, what gets triggered. So again, for my payroll payment or for my payroll, you can see here the per pay reports. Um, so when they close, that posted a report archive, what reports get posted for that per pay reports or the quarterly reports. And then again, your monthly reports and fiscal. So again, if you wanna take a look at that, um, we have them detailed out what will show exactly under each file archive um, header and then what reports are getting sent directly to um, that section of that file archive. So you just wanna make sure you, in a timely manner that they get those closed and they don't sit open for months on end. Okay. 
Okay. Let's see. We'll go to our next. So the next thing they want to do is, let me get back to my checklist here. Um, any addition. So your next thing will be adding if you have any new employees that come in. Um, and then adding all of their position, payroll items, pay distribution, payroll accounts. So um, you want to make sure that you're adding any changing of pay accounts. Uh, maybe some grant um, payroll accounts came in or things need to be changed. So they want to make sure that they go ahead and change their payroll accounts. Also, the next thing would be any payroll item changes that they may have. Um, probably not right now in the middle. Um, in March, you probably don't have much changes, but maybe um, if any city changes at the calendar end or OSDI, that would probably be um, your, when the changes would happen. Also, um, another thing is if you have mapping, make sure that you um, go ahead and get your mapping. If you do have a new accounts and those need to be mapped for um, employer distribution or um, to be in the correct account, um, this would be also that time to do this to make sure they add, update those um, accounts. Um, the another thing that they could do is adding of error adjustments. Uh, maybe you have your districts have employees that error adjustments need to be added um, for this upcoming payroll. So they want to make sure that, that they check that off their list and get those entered in. And if you have any new contracts or mid-year contract changes and or updates, um, so they want to make sure they go ahead and get those um, entered now if they have to for this pay coming up, then they want to make sure they get those done. Okay. On to the next. Is adding your new employees. So now we have um, different options, actually four different ways you can add employees in. So for the new um, people at, at the ITCs that may not be familiar, uh, too familiar yet with how um, all the processes of adding a new employee, um, I'm not going to go through each one. I'm probably going to end up going through, I kind of decided this morning, uh, the employee um, onboarding. Um, I think many, I don't know how many of your districts are using this. Um, if you'd like to comment, I kind of like to know how many are using that employee onboarding um, or they are they still using the employee dashboard. Um, I'm kind of like to know kind of where they're at and because the workflows I think is your, probably your best option. Um, it's very specific and, and it's very time saving. But I will go through the four that are out there. Um, the first is, again, the old fashioned way of going through core. Um, if they like going through core and adding and going through each one, that is up to them. Um, again, but again, for the first thing you need to do is adding your employee. That always has to be the first thing that you do. Um, the other one that we have out there is the mass load of adding the employee. Again, we have our documentation out here that is very helpful. And also, if you go to help in public shared reports library, don't know if um, I'm sure all of you know about this one, and they can go ahead to these reports here. And these are reports that we have added over the years that can be helpful and you can send these to your districts um, for them to use also. You can click the report um, JSON and save those and send those to your districts. Again, um, I won't go through all of these. Um, we do have ones for the per pay reports, which is what probably Lori will go over tomorrow. And then we also have um, their monthly, quarterly, fiscal year to date based reports calendar year um, based reports, EMIS related reports that um, if you're uh, starting EMIS, 
We also have our miscellaneous reports, and you can go ahead and take a look at all of those. Um, can be very helpful. Um, the ones that we're going to look at are the new hire employee templates. Um, again, if the districts are still um, using mass load to enter their employees in, um, again, that um, is their um, choice. But to make it a little easier, if they didn't know about these, you can definitely go ahead and send them um, to um, your districts. And we have the employee, new position. We also have the new, non, new contract or non-contract compensation. We have the leaves, paid distribution, payroll items, and pay account. And these are all set up and ready to go with the correct headers, and you just have to enter the information. I do have one out here with the new employee template that I have. Bring that over here. And this is kind of what um, the CSV will look like and what you will need to enter in your information for that employee. I was going to go ahead and import this, but I kind of want to use the workflows um, to enter a new employee in. So I'm going to kind of wait, but I just wanted to show you this. So once you, if they do use this, and then they would use the mass load, and they would choose your file that you just seen, and then also do employee. And that would load that employee in to uh, under core into the employee. And again, if you get any errors, it will state how many were loaded or if they all were errors. So either you'll get one record loaded and zero errors, or you'll get zero loaded with one error. And again, you will get your warning messages here. And also you still get that at error report or the employee error report. So again, um, I think these reports would be very helpful and um, to create reports for your districts if they need. And we also, um, one other thing before I move on is the custom form templates. Those are all here um, for direct deposit defaults with pay group. Uh, the new W-4. Um, again, if your districts might like these, you can go ahead and take a look at them and you can add to them if you like. Okay. So since we have the core option to add new employees, we have the mass load, which I guess I have to go back here. But again, you have your mass load. Again, you can use the ones for public library, which we already have set up. So you don't have to go through each and get um, the position set up or um, the compensation or the leaves. Um, again, we have those all out here ready for you to use for the new employee. But if you do have questions on the headers, um, again, um, utilize the mass load and, oh, sorry, I got it. There you go, Carol, you should be in now, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so, okay, so, and then the third option that you have out there to use for adding of an employee is your employee dashboard. Again, you have to add the employee first under core, so you manually have to add them, or again, do the mass load for the employee side um, first, and you can get those all in there first on the employee and then you can go ahead over to the employee dashboard and continue with adding that employee once that employee portion has been added first. So if you are a big district and you have 20, 30 employees coming in at uh, each payroll, um, again, use the mass load, which we have under the public library, the new employee CSV, enter those employees in, and then you can go to employee dashboard. And then from there, so you don't forget each step that needs to be added is all here listed for you. So you don't forget those steps. Um, again, I'm not sure how many are still using this option, but again, this is a third way that they can add for employees. Now the portion that I was going to work on was the um, employee onboarding which I think is great 
Now, again, if your districts do not have this set up yet, then you have to work with them, um, probably with your um, tech department. And again, we have that documentation out here, step-by-step step of how to get this workflow set up so districts can start using that. And that's under, um, let me shrink this down a little bit. Okay, it's under utilities, oh, excuse me, down below, if you search through the side, you will see under um, UCS integration, it's the workflows. So this is in our documentation. And then if you click on the workflows, you will see um, the installation guide. And if you click here, you can get this set up and it um, tells exactly how to get this um, API key generated, set it up for your districts and get so that way this workflows shows up here. Again, I won't go through all that. We do have that all in the documentation um, for you to get them set up. So once they are set up and they get to the employee onboarding part of it, um, again, we have um, how to make sure this employee onboarding portion is showing. So if we go here, um, it's a module that needs to be set up. So once that module is set, workflows module. you will get to see then this workflows here. So again, um, I'm not gonna go through it by detail. Um, all the documentation is there for you to get the workflow set up and for your districts to start um, operating using that. So I'm gonna use this to add my first employee um, that I have a new employee that came in and I'm going to start using um, to get this employee entered by using this. Again, um, on the workflows admin, um, I can see my employees and whereabouts I'm in the creation of my employees. So like Tom Cruise, um, we're still in the middle of adding um, three different things yet. Um, so we have, so you can see about where you are in your task of adding them. So I will go to my employee onboarding and I'm just gonna start my new employee. Um, again, um, if, you, if your districts use the assigned employee number, you can go ahead and use that or you can just enter in your own um, employee ID. So I'm gonna go ahead and just enter my employee in. I already have ready and set to go. So now I have my Tammy Miller, and now I can go ahead and I can start the whole process from employee onboarding. I don't have to go back and forth here and then over here to add the rest. This does the all everything for you, all in this one step here. So you can go ahead and start your task. And again, you would have to have um, a few information entered in here. Um, before you can move on. So um, specifically, if you're using direct deposit notices, um, you wanna make sure you have your email address in. I'm just gonna type in a address. Um, and again, the other email address, you wanna make sure that's filled in. That is used by SIRS when they're doing, the, I believe, the new hire report. So they wanna make sure they always have for SIRS employees, the other email address entered. I'm just gonna enter in a phone number. And again, you can go ahead and get the rest of your information set up. Um, it's gonna be email direct deposit employee. And then you wanna go ahead and enter your information that for the rest 
that you need before you um, move on to your next. Okay. Again, um, I'll just say my hire date was back here. Started like the 21st. Okay. Um, if I need a birthday in there. Okay, again, you can use the check distribution if you need to. Um, and also you can use custom. Um, if you, if you want to ask custom field definitions, you can change the fields to the um, payroll money. Um, they can change the headers of those if they like to what they want to. Um, like for instance, here we added insurance under the standard payroll or again, standard personnel. They can add different custom fields to their liking. Um, again, they probably want to do that before they start their um, employee onboarding or entering of the employee. But again, they have that option to add different um, custom fields to their employee screen. Okay. Um, again, um, I don't know how many of your districts utilize the templates, but we have uh, for employee, you can use the templates. You can set up different employees by um, certified. You can do classified employees, bus drivers. Um, again, if you um, want to be able to set employees up, you definitely can do that. Um, probably this maybe you don't use templates as often for this one because probably all the information is different. But again, you do have that option to create a template on that. So I'm gonna go and save and I'm gonna complete my task. So once I do that, then it's gonna move me on to the next options here. So now I can go ahead and create my position. I have to do that before I create my compensation. So it's right in step. And I'm just gonna go ahead and create my position one. And then what my um, description is, I'm gonna say ticket. And then again, you can choose your pay groups. And again, if the employee is in a retirement system. And again, what your hire date is. Let's not put that in there. And again, you can enter in the rest of the information that you need. Um, again, if they're going to be eligible for sick or personal or vacation leave, then you want to go ahead and get that all in, entered in by clicking the eligibility flags. Um, EMIS um, related information, again, um, each employee may be different on that. So they can go ahead and enter that information in uh, according to that employee. And again, we have um, templates. So again, for position, um, they can go ahead in advance and get these positions uh, templates set up and they can use those then when they're creating the position. So maybe they have um, all the coaches that probably maybe are classified all in search. So they can get all these fields um, set up for all those coaches. And then all they have to do is maybe do a little tweaking to maybe their hire date, start date, such as that. But I think it can save a lot of time for districts if they do have all these um, positions set up. So again, they can set them up as um, certified, classified employees, um, your bus drivers, and there's an unlimited number that they can um, enter. So um, I know I've seen um, some districts have a list of positions entered, and I'm sure that's probably very um, helpful and time-saving. Okay, so we'll go ahead and I'm gonna complete that task. And then now, since I have that compass position entered, you can create that next compensation. 
Okay. So again, you have that option to enter a contract or a non-contract. So if you do contract, it will know what, what fields that have to be entered. So you see it changed. So if you go back to non-contract, again, it's smaller. They don't have a whole lot of like the contract obligation and such. Um, but we're gonna do the contract. So again, um, you're gonna wanna have employees that are probably like teachers that are on a stretch pay with work days on their job calendar. Um, they will be contract. Now for non-contract employees, those would be employees like um, that are not on calendar, job calendars that have work days. And also it could be your subs for teaching, um, your time slip employees. So maybe lunch, um, lunch employees um, that come in and sub, that would be your non-contract employees that you don't have them set on a set calendar. And that would be on a default calendar. So again, contract would be more of your teachers or anybody that's on a stretch pay with work days. So I'll go ahead. Now your code, that is unique. Um, you would need to have set, it's only set to this compensation. So every compensation will have its own code. So you can enter when you're creating your own, you can enter in a code that you want. So I'm just gonna say, um, this is for 24, 2024. So that's my unique code for this. Um, again, you have to decide if what pay plan you're on, what pay unit, and the label. This has just been changed on our last releases. Um, when you're entering in future, that description, this is where it's gonna pull that description when you're entering in future. So you wanna make sure your labels um, are easy to read for when you're entering in. If you have them the label blank, it will then revert to the description and use that instead And when you're in future. So just remind, remember that, that if the label, it will always use the label when you're entering in future entries, that description is going to be the label. So again, districts um, can use it um, any way they want this label to describe um, what compensation they are in. I see a lot of them use like fiscal year 24 or 2324. Um, again, it's up to the district how they want to enter those in. And I'm just going to enter in tickets. Um, again, you want to go ahead and enter in your days, your hours per day. Um, I have a job counter set up with days already. And then it's my X, X there it is, XPB. And then I'm going to go ahead and have my start date entered. And then my end date. Now your start date will always be the first physical date that your teacher or your that person is starting work, their first work day. Now the end date can be different for different jobs. Um, maybe teachers, they work till the end of May as work days on their job calendar, but they're stretch paid over the summer months. So they got to remember to push that date into that day before where their new fiscal year 25 contract is gonna start. Even though I don't have work days, we gotta have it stretched out so they'll get paid over those six weeks of the summer months. So to say that my this employee's next contract for fiscal year 25 is gonna start on the 22nd, we're gonna put an end date of the 21st. So this will end on the 21st, and then when they import the new contract for the next, it will pick up that 22nd, and we'll pay off this one and start the new contract. Now, if they're employees that are um, don't have on work days on a, on a calendar, or maybe they don't get paid over the summer months and they are done by the end of uh, May, then you can put a stop date of the end of May. 
because they are not going to be stretch paid into the summer months. Again, the calendar start and stop dates are very important because we do have reports that use that. That's for EMS uh, reporting, ODGFS reporting. So again, they want to make sure these dates are always updated with their new contracts. I'm just going to put my date in. Okay, so now you can go ahead and enter your rest of your information. And I'll make sure it's stretch paid. We'll see, we'll save it and see if we get an error. Make sure we're stretch when we're paid per period. Nope, did not work. See what happened here. Mm -hmm. Oh, pays and contract, very important. So we got to um, put our pays and contract. And let's see. Pays and period. Ah, keep on forgetting things. Pays per pay concern. I don't know why that's not saving. I don't know what I'm missing here. Got my... Daily, got my calendar, stretch pay. Hmm. Well, I'll just put it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, we'll just put that in and sure why it's not. Okay. At least I got something in there. Okay, so we'll go ahead and complete the task. Okay, so we have our compensation in. So the next thing is we can go ahead and add our payroll account. And again, we'll go ahead and click on add account. And then here you have an option to search down by scrolling. Or you can enter in the beginning of the um the account, if you're only searching for O1 accounts. And again, you have this search option. So you can do, um, you include all the accounts, or if you just, um, which include all the accounts that they have, or they can just include um, their payroll accounts. So again, um, they can go ahead and click on which account that will be. And select the account. So again, um, maybe they have grant accounts that they're gonna do a fixed amount to. Um, so again, they can put in um, how much is going to be charged and the max amount. And then they can also enter start and stop dates of when this um, account will start and will it when it will end. And also they can add the employer distribution or leave projection and if it's a status of active or inactive or if it's specific or a maximum amount. So if you have a fixed amount, you also will need a, a count to be the uh, remaining of it would have to be the per, um, 100%. So I'm just going to just put this as 100% and go ahead and save. So again, they can have as many payroll counts set up as they like, fixed, and then they if they have fixed, they have to have one as 100%. Okay. Um, the next thing is the payroll items. Um, the one thing that I wanted before we move on to that is get over here. Okay. So I don't get out of that. Is on the payroll items. Before you actually really get into or adding your payroll items, if you're using the employee um, onboarding is to make sure that you have these set up according to what items you wanna show. 
So if I sl select in here and start, now these have to be done before you actually start the employee. So I kind of um, went backwards on this, but I just wanted to show you. As you can see these here, these are ones that are non-modifiable. These are required. And how we got them set up to be required is actually if you go to the payroll items configuration and you click here, required. So you can go ahead and get all those payroll items that are required for your employees so they show up under this payroll items and you don't have to go ahead and add payroll items down here. It's a little time saver and that is an option for them to do. Now, as you can see here, these are mo uh, modifiable to like um, to delete. I can't delete the ones I require, but I can delete these. So this employee, so you can um, select employee that's maybe um, SIRS or STIRS, and then you delete the other. So if it's a SIRS employee, then you would delete the STIRS and um, these two. And how you get those is if you go to the payroll item configuration and click on that, like the 400, and you're going to see show on create wizard. So that means that I it's an option for those employees and um, you can go ahead and delete those before you complete that task. So again, you can go down to any of these payroll item configurations and get them either required or you can get them as um, show on create wizard. But again, you have to do that before you start the employee onboarding. So you're, if you're in the middle of employee onboarding and you say, oh, I forgot, I want to make this a required one. And you go into payroll item configuration now, add it and come back to the same employee. You're not going to see that um, because it has to be in the beginning of uh, before you start that employee. So anybody that's uh, any employees that are started as of now, um, that changing of those flags won't matter. So I kind of went in before and kind of added some so you can see. So again, I think that's um, very helpful. Um, so you don't forget of adding maybe um, the 692. Um, a lot of districts forget to add that Medicare. So now you can add that as a required and they cannot complete that task without um, finishing. So again, if I go into my federal, um, again, you can do your tax tables. Again, you, you can have, if you already have templates sent up for your payroll items, again, um, utilize those. So all they have to do, everything is entered and they can go ahead and save. Now, if you get errors, if you forget something, which is nice, so your filing status, so that probably, you again, you can do a federal tax item and have them all set up to different filing statuses if you like to. So go ahead and save. Move on to the next one, same thing. I already have a template set up for that. It takes me right to my tax tables. Now, if I have to enter in any other information, again, that would have to be manually done if you have exemptions or additional withholdings. My city tax, this is um, again. Now, if you have city tax, and I know districts probably have probably 30, 50 different city tax, just depends how big your district is. Again, utilize the uh, templates, get those created before you start your employee onboarding. That will be helpful. Um, in my test account, I only have two set up. So I just go ahead and it already has my rate in, um, how, what's my pay cycle, the percent. Um, again, if you're utilizing the percent of gross, um, again, you will have to make sure um, they update that. So again, this can be used for RITA and CCA. Um, RITA, they, I think, it, is it RITA or CCA uses the deduction type of employment or residence. So again, you can utilize that to get those um, all set up so they don't forget that when they're creating employees that their district has a city that's all CCA or RITA and they can have that set up correctly so they don't have problems at the end of W-2 time. 
So now it comes to my retirement. Again, if I'm a SERS employee or a STRS, um, I'm going to make this one a SERS, SERS employee. So I can go ahead and just delete that out. And they have to be deleted out because if you try to save with those in there, they're going to get an error. So I'll just go ahead. And again, you might have your default already set up. Um, again, use that default for that employee. All right, new employee, and I already have my employer rate in. Same goes for my 590. I already have my 590 set up, has my rate in there. Um, again, if you have to add any other personal, you know, information just for that employee, that's specific to that employee, you can do so. Now that I'm down to my Medicare, I cannot save my Medicare record. I'm going to try it. Let's save it and see what happens. What did let us let's see? Yeah. Okay. So it's saying um, I must have um, rate types. So it won't let you save. If you have one that's required and you have not completed it, it will give you an error. So we'll go ahead and enter. I have my rates in already. Now, if it's, um, again, you can have one that's full pickup. So you can have one that's for regular employees and you also can have a template for um, your Medicare pickup employees. And then my OSCI. Again, if you have that already set up, you can go ahead and enter that in. Or if you have your templates, then you can save. So now I can save complete task. And if I forgot any um, required fields, um, I would get an error and then you would it, it have to um, um, find which one you're missing. It should tell you, but it might just say rate type and you might have to go in there and look. Okay. So that's your payroll items. Um, next is your leaves. So again, um, I only have... Um, you can go ahead and set up this employee. Here you can actually enter a balance. Now, if the employee comes, transfers from another district, and in their, um, when they were hired, they're saying, okay, we will transfer your 20 um, sick days. You can enter those in here, and they'll already start with a balance of the 20 days. Or if they give them the uh, 20 days of just, um, right off the start of the balance just for being hired into the district, they can add that in now right here. So my personal days um, be balanced and my reset and daily. My sick days, um, again, if you start off with a balance, you can go ahead and enter that in. What do they get a cum per month? Um, maybe districts, uh, maybe employees are not sick a lot and they are going to have a max. Um, again, they can't go over like 100 days of leave. Once they hit that leave um, amount, then they'll stop accruing. Okay. And then my vacation. So again, you can do the same thing and get the vacation set up. So now the employee has their vacation and leave set up. Okay. So the next thing is your pay distributions. Now what your pay distributions will be is your um, direct deposit or checks. So you go ahead and add your pay distribution and again, employees can have multiple direct deposits going into four different savings that they like, or if they want to do a direct deposit for savings and the remainder in a check, they have that option to do that now. So again, um, districts can use their own codes. I'm still used to the classic codes of the 700. So again, um, it just depends um, what codes they are using now. That is up to them. They can... Um, have specific ones. Again, is my direct deposit going to be percent or fixed amount? If you have a fixed amount of $50, you have to make sure that you have a 100% um, 
also. So we'll have to add one more. Um, again, if this is not supposed to start to a certain time frame of a payroll, then you would enter in that payroll start date here. So it starts, if it's supposed to start in, um, immediately, then you can go ahead and just leave that blank. And again, you have the option to add abbreviations, account numbers. Um, of course, you have to enter account number, excuse me. Just enter it in. And again, what um, your deposit will be if it's savings or is it um, checking? And again, um, you can find your routing number. A lot of districts only have one payroll ACH um, transfer. So again, you just select that. But again, if you have two different accounts or something, you want to make sure you get the right ACH um, source code selected. Okay. So now that I have that added, but I have a fix, I still need to go in there and get my 100% added. So now I should be able to complete the task and I won't get a warning because I have a fix of um, 50 and 100%. Okay, good deal. So that, um, so this is uh, the way the employee onboarding works. And I think it goes a lot faster than the other three options that we have. But again, it's up to the district on how they want to enter um, those. But I think in the long run, especially the payroll items, you can set those flags for your districts to say, you can't go past and you cannot save, uh, complete this task before uh, federal's in, um, a 692 um, Medicare is in, um, I think it will eliminate a lot of mistakes. And then at year end, if they forgot to pull um, re retirement maybe out for employee or if they forgot to do re uh, Medicare, um, this is going to eliminate that problem. Okay. Um, I have no questions. So again, if you have any questions, please let me know or if I'm going too fast. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, before we move on, um, one other thing I wanted to look let you know, um, I guess we can go ahead and review. Let's do that. So let's go ahead and review this. And this is your final review before it goes over under core. So again, if you have to stop and you have to go do something else, again, it's saved here for you. You can see you're in review. Now, since I'm admin, I can go ahead and um, I can delete these. Well, I guess I'm, I probably am this user too in my test account. So, but um, if you didn't start that task, you won't be able to, to delete those, I don't believe. So let's go back to employee onboarding. Let's go ahead and finish Tammy and go to review. And then let's go ahead and, um, and again, you can double check. You can go through each one and do a quick check over. And here you can still change things. I mean, you can change things once it goes over to under the core, once you complete the task. But right now you still have the option that you can still go in here and make changes if need be. So I'm going to go ahead and complete the task. Now, if I forgot anything in any of these areas, um, and now she is removed. And if I go to workflows, you'll see she is removed here. So we know that she is now, you can go to employee or I'm going to go my employee dashboard. And again, I forgot the address, of course, but um, all your information will be here. So again, um, if you forgot something, you have an option to go back in here and do that. Um, if you do keep track of your contracts and maybe um, you print their screens, you have that option to print the screen um, after you um, added the employee. You can do this after maybe new contracts um, and you can print that screen. And you can put that in the employee folder. 
if need be, or, or you can print it off so you can do a double, triple check to make sure you entered all the amounts correctly. And it's easier to print that off and look at it. And then that can go in their folder. The other thing is salary notices. You can um, create a salary notice right here on their compensation. Um, again, you have these different options. And this is only going to print that this um, salary notice for this employee. Um, if you're in contracts there, you can do um, by pay group, um, by um, or you can print every salary notice that you have under in your grid in the maintenance. But again, this is just for this employee. So again, you check which form you want to use. And then you can generate it or you can email that salary notice to that employee and set up an email notice. So if I click that and we'll just do a show. And then here's your salary notice for that employee. So again, um, you have that option to print that right from this screen. And again, um, maybe an audit report is needed um, for the auditors or if they keep track and maybe want to put this in their file, um, they have the option to do this of uh, when they added it. And I'll show you kind of what it looks like. Okay. So here is your audit report and it just shows you everything that, that you added or they added. And again, they can go through this if they have questions of they're saying, well, I didn't do that. Well, again, we have the audit report to show that yes, or they did or nope, they didn't. Um, so again, this is can be uh, utilized and you can put in any dates on that. Okay. I think we're, we're good. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to show was these um, pay distributions, payroll accounts, um, and leaves. Uh, they're just different ways of showing um, the leaves and they can look at, show different things in the grid. They can see everything now on this grid. So if they're looking at one employee, they don't have to go in and edit that employee and look for all these information, um, things that they may want. So again, they can add to their grid if they use this and they can see what is entered. Right now we don't have a report for this, but that is, and um, we do have a feedback issue for that. Um, so they can print that off if they want. Right now, they can probably do a screenshot and save that. Um, the other thing is the pay distributions for new. Again, this is um, nice. They have all that information on the grid. So now they don't have to go and edit and find see that employee and is, see what exactly they have. And I thought I had another. That makes me wonder why my a distribution for Miller isn't there. Oh, <laughs> I put Tammy as her first name and Miller as her last. Well, that would make that would make a difference. So there you go. That is why. Okay. So at least we know why I can't find that person. Okay. So Tammy is my last name. So now I can just find that employee that I just added and see that. Okay. Um, the next one is the payroll accounts new. Um, this is another nice one that they, now you can see all the counts on the grid for that employee. And if you're looking just for um, that one position for that employee, 
You can do that by doing searching in your header columns and that is not working. There it goes. I had to do equal one. Didn't like just one. And again, you can add to your grids. And now you can see everything and they can customize their grid. So every time they go in there, they can see all these columns. So it's a little bit more user-friendly than the old Lee's under core. Okay. Okay, so those were the three options there I wanted. Is there any questions as of right now on anything with adding a new employee? Um, try to hit everything on that. Okay. So now we're going to go back to our, where are we at here? To our appendix. And our checklist. Okay, so we've done our one and our two. Uh, we just did our three. Um, again, um, just a reminder, make sure they um, utilize the templates. That's very hand, hand, um, helpful. Um, the workflow, I think they really would like the workflow because of the payroll items. And um, and anything else that they need to enter, like payroll um, item um, amounts changing. So if they have any of those things, they want to remember to do that before they start their payroll. So I think I had a list of stuff here, so I didn't forget anything. So we'll go ahead on to number four. Um, again, now you have your options. Um, a lot of districts of your districts are probably using third party software to pull their absence and attendance in. So they may not be using um, spreadsheets anymore and create their own, but if they are, they still have that option. So we have the option to enter um, attendance and um, absence to your import. Um, so three options we have is entering an employee dashboard. So again, if they wanna use their employee dashboard, they type in their employee and they can go to attendance and add either create a um, one and then they can copy the rows. So if I do that, I'm gonna maybe enter two. So I wanna have activity date, I'll go back in July. You can do absence or attendance. Again, what is your appointment type? Again, you can do a pay date. So you don't want this to hit to a certain pay date. You can have that option. And then also if they use the sub for it, they can enter that in too. Maybe this employee was sick one day. I'll just go ahead and enter in today they have that and they can do that all right here now if they utilize the posting they can just save it and then they can go up here into processing or payroll excuse me and enter in in future separately or they can have time saving and utilize this posting to current and future um, now, future would be before you started your payroll, which would be us right now. And then tomorrow, if Lori uses uh, after she uh, initializes payroll and they forgot to enter in employees, they can utilize this post to current and it directly takes um, this attendance and um, can pay them. And it takes it over to attendance and it puts it into future. So let's go ahead and post to future. They won't let me. There it goes, just a little slow. So now you'll see my attendance for this employee. In here, um, you don't have, you cannot change if you forgot to change these already. You probably might have to go in there and do that um, after this is posted. 
Um, but you do have the option to change it to a different pay type. So if I want that to be miscellaneous, I can change that now. Or if it's a supplemental tax option and that's different, that can be changed here also. So again, once you have that figured out how you want that to be um, charged to the pay type, you can select post select records to future. So now when I go to future, I'm gonna see my Tammy is here. Now, again, if you have to make um, error or corrections like the lead projection or something was checked and it shouldn't be, at this time, this is where you could do that. Okay. So that is one way of entering in your, um, your leave or your attendance, excuse me. Um, the other option is actually going right under attendance, under core. And here you can do, again, like I just did before, create. You can do one employee or you can copy rows and just keep adding different employees. It doesn't have to be the same employee. But if you're doing a mass add, and you can go ahead and select that employee and their position. And then you can do it like attendance. You can enter, you can include weekends. So it adds the weekends on for your Sunday and Saturday, or you can uh, go ahead and click on those days. So if I'm, I'm going back into August and July here, like I can click days. And I can create, or you can enter your start and stop dates and then it will select those um, dates down here on the calendar for you. Again, you have that posting option, posting to current if you're ready to initialize payroll or to current. So I'm gonna post to current and I'm going to go ahead and create. If I don't get an error, because I already had those in there. So again, you have that option to change um, the pay type. And actually here, you do have the option to um, change the employee distribution or lead projection. So here you can do that right here in this screen if, you, if, it's, um, if it's not supposed to be employer distribution. So you wanna make sure everything is correct in here post to future, and records have been posted. And again, you can do that and you can keep going then for all your employees. So now if we go to future, now you're gonna see there's my 10 units for my one employee. Okay. All right, so the other one that you can do is you import. Uh, now, this would be like for your third party software, if your districts are using that, or if they're creating their own worksheets or uh, CSVs for their import. Um, again, um, they can utilize our, um, our import. Where is my, here we go. Let's go. Utility, yeah. Under utilities and attendance and import. And here they can use, um, these are, have to be in these specific record format. Um, they have to be in this order. They cannot like mass load where you can just pick and choose um, the ones that you need and then just optional ones. They can just go wherever. It's not like that. Um, the uh, um, attendance and absence import um, has to be in this correct order or it will fail and you'll have different columns going in different places. So again, um, just remember, um, these are have to be in this specific order on your spreadsheet. So again, I have one here. I bring it over. Here is an example of one. 
And as you can see, um, I have these headers in here. You don't need to have them in there, but again, because um, it, it, it will, they will just, um, you'll get an error or a, an error just saying line one, um, nothing happened to it, um, which is fine. So you can have it in there. But again, this is kind of an example of my, um, how I set up my attendance. And then I also have one for absence. Now, again, um, for USP import, um, you can have it all on one file, um, the absence and attendance, I believe, yeah. So, so if I wanna go ahead and import those in, I will go ahead and choose my file. Again, you can um, change your location code if you use that. You can now do the post to future or current. And again, I'm gonna do future since I'm um, working with the pre payroll. And again, you have the option to combine attendance entries. So just remember on that, um, each attendance entry for that employee has to have the same information in like um, description, um, here, I'll show, mm -hmm. where's that at? Right here. Um, so if you do the combine entries, so then that way you don't show 20 on the employee's direct deposit or, or on the um, pay report. Um, the This is in order for those to, to combine together in current or future, um, you have to have, these are the necessary, so it's employee ID, job number, pay type, unit, unit amount, tax option, retirement. So all these have to match um, in order for those AT entries to combine. If those don't um, all figure in, then you're gonna see some separate lines. So the, if the districts are trying to use that and they're not seeing those lines combining, have them double checked and make sure that all these match first, okay? Um, the other thing is um, if, if the district allows the negative lead balances, again, that's up to the district how they want to handle that. And again, your default um, payroll count for that position will be used, or is it the sub for SSN's um, payroll count? So let's go ahead and see if I get an error or not. Okay, I didn't. So as you can see down here, that's that one error that I said you would get indicator because um, it's that one line. But if I had other errors in there, you would see them here listed exactly what they were. And also um, I had it in my at error. And I, uh, let me see what happened to it. There it is. Open it up. And you would an at error stating the same thing that you would see here. So my at error is here and I have nothing indicated. So I am good. And as you can see, that's what that error you would get, which is okay. Okay. Also, the other thing that we added here recently is this records loaded errors, total records, future pays, and current pays, which I think this is very nice. So um, I would not have them click off if they're waiting for this to load um, and they want to go to another screen to start working while that's loading. I would have them wait because I think this is nice. Um, they can see like my one error, of course, is my header, which is okay. And then I did have four records because I had four lines, but three loaded, which was correct. My future pay is loaded and then my current pay. So again, if Lori does the current tomorrow, um, when she's in her after she initializes and does a current payload, then this is what you would see your records loaded here as three and mine would be zero. So again, we know that my records loaded and they all loaded correctly. So now if I go to attendance, And you will see my seven right here, seven, um, six, eight, and nine. Uh, somewhere in here, maybe. Oh, yes, right there, seven, one, two, and four. So those are my records. And then again, under payroll future, 
You can see my employees that I added for subbing. Those were my three employees. So now if I want to do um, an absence load, if I do them separately, um, I can do the absence. And that is just, I don't know if I probably won't have any because I don't, I just have the. Okay, so here um, it just lists that invalid indicator error on this one. And then I did get an error for my um, one employee, uh, ABSI, um, pays paid equals number of pays. So this is kind of what your error will look like on this report. And again, if you um, shows the exact same thing on the at error, here it is. And you can see that employee here. And again, you can use this at error, make that correction and use this um, CSV to load back in if you like. You don't have to use the other um, original one and do the correction. I'm not gonna correct it right now, but, and again, here you can see, um, I think I used uh, old, old CSV and I did a delete and I deleted all these columns. And I think that's why I'm getting these header invalid record headers because there must've been something still in that line when I deleted them out, but. So, but it will show you records loaded, errors, total records, and um, since the absence, it didn't load into future because we don't load um, just attendance, excuse me. So I think that's uh, utilized that's very nice. Okay. So there is the import. Now your other option is, is using mass load. Um, don't know how many districts use the mass load. Um, is probably with a third party software, um, but that option is out there. And again, if you go to the mass load documentation, in here we have the attendance and absence load. And then um, you can download the template and enter that information in. So that would be just your. Um, attendance. And then also if you're doing future, then you would have to do your future load. And again, we have mass load documentation for that. And I do have an example here. Here's the mass load. And I you have to have the ID column there. Um, if you're adding new, it will be blank. Now, if you're updating a future re record that you already entered, maybe you entered in 500 future records and, oh my gosh, I um, entered something wrong for these employees. Well, you have the option to correct that using the future pay, update future pay amount, um, but they would just have to make sure they get this ID number um, from inside that column um, under more. So again, they have that option. So I just wanted to show, and I'll go ahead and see if I can do that mass load and no problems here. And future, future pay amounts. I got one error and it's probably my header, I'm hoping. My computer's a little bit slow, sorry. Come on, there it is. Oh, and here you go. So it told me my new employee that I entered, I didn't have the compensation code correct. It couldn't read it and I didn't. Um, my compensation code, I think um, for that employee, I had, I think something different in there. So again, um, you would have to, oh, and, um, yeah, I think it is the actually the compensation code that's wrong. So again, my mass load failed. Um, you will get a USP load error. Again, you can use the USP load error, correct that information, and then reuse, choose that um, error file and re in um, mass loaded in. And then you will get your um, loaded into payroll. Okay. 
So we'll go back to our checklist. Okay, so we did employee dashboard for attendance. We did um, using core attendance. We also used the USP import. And then we also did for uh, absence, absences. And um, so now um, there's certain reports that you can use for balancing before you initialize the payroll under home. You'll see here our attendance journal. And this will list everything that you put into your attendance. So um, again, you can put in by, uh, if you wanna check certain employees, if you wanna check only classified employees that so you have separate spreadsheets, um, you can check that, or you wanna just check the absences that you loaded in, you have that option. I'm just gonna check everything that I loaded from 7.1 to 7.23. And here is my list. So again, you can go ahead and start checking and make sure that you entered all these employees in for their attendance and what absences. And again, you can break that down to specific um, columns. The other thing that you can use for um, balancing is this SSDT future pay amount report. And again, you can enter in what dates that you're searching for. I'm just going to enter in, and it probably will be your um, beginning and ending payroll dates, but I'm just entering in um, the month for now um, so I can get everybody so I can just show you. Um, again, you can run it by pay groups. So if you only, um, or if you entering people in by pay groups, you want to make sure all your timesheet people are in for coaches or for um, subs or lunchtime, um, you can do that if you haven't broke down into pay groups. I'm just going to run it by and I have no data. Why didn't I then? All right. Let's just, I'm just gonna leave a blank. Maybe that's why. There we go. Didn't like my dates for some reason. Okay. So now you can see my dates are all in, or all my future entries are in, and you can double check to make sure um, that this is all correct. Now, this would be very handy for districts to keep and print off. Because sometimes when they're looking, um, if they go in and they finish a pay and they're saying, oh, this um, federal tax is way off or um, why is this being taxed differently? They'd be able to see this right here, the supplemental tax option. This will show what option, taxing option they um, selected. So that can be very helpful. I mean, they can find that also under utilities and um, or you can, I'd say, because I don't think they can. Is if I'm correct, uh, custom grade creator. I know you guys can see it, ITC, the districts cannot, but I know I utilize this a lot um, when we have questions come in. And if you go to future, so anything they entered in future, you'll be able to see here for that employee. Now current, we don't have one, I believe for current right now, but you'll be able to see and it keeps it and you'll be able to search and find how did I, um how did they tax that? What um what it apply for retirement. And you have that different options to add into your grid. So you can see, and you can um, bring employees in for a certain pay period, um, a certain payroll. You can add um, anything to this column to make it easier for you to search if a uh, district says, why, is, why was this tax so odd? Um, one place to start would be here. If they don't have that future pay report, use this because then you can see, oh, they use the wrong supplemental tax and this is why it's taxed way off. Um, usually that is the case. So again, um, only you at the ITC can use this as of now. I think we have a feedback issue in for that, for districts to use that. Um, but again, this would be a, a start for them. Okay. Um, 
Okay. I think we went through everything that I wanted to. Future pay reports. Okay. Yep. We end to here. So tomorrow, Lori is going to start the initializing of the payroll. And hopefully I don't cause her any errors when she's creating or initializing creating and the pay report is with my employee. So um, is there any questions on today or if they want something to go over that maybe I didn't go over clearly enough? I tried to hit all the key options that are out there for us and I hope I didn't forget anything. Well, you guys are just all so quiet out there. Okay, um, I guess then that's all we're gonna have for today. Again, Lori will be back tomorrow um, at nine and we will be going over the, let's see, she will be going over the beginning of the payroll process. And again, we have an hour and a half for that tomorrow. So um, it may go under, it may go over, just depends. All right. Well, thank you, Carol. You also, I appreciate you coming today and joining me. And I hope you all have a wonderful day.